talk not only are we a body that we can't say to one part of the body that the other part of the body isn't significant, but everything works together. It also talks about that we're a house that are built together and it becomes a holy sanctuary where the presence of God is or God exists. And, and I love that because it's, uh, it's, it gives me it gives me hurt, it gives me joy. But but I get to when I experience that, man, I do. Ex we experience God. When we do come together, when we're leaning on each other's strength and, 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 and what, how God has gifted each other, as we do come together like a house built together, a stone, living stones on top of each other, we do get to experience who God is. There's a greater picture of God. I, I love it when I was working, when we are working in this church and, and in other ministry positions where we have a diverse group of people and I get to appreciate, hey, how God is, is showing himself in one culture and in another culture and you come together and you see just how glorious and how awesome God is. And that's why when we talk about this series, one another, that's why we want to do this series. That's why we were like, yes, we've got to focus on coming together as a community. That's why we've got to focus on strengthening one another and being there for one another. Because when we do, we as a church, we look more and more like God and who He is. His character, it shines through us as we begin to be, or we continue to be, obedient to His commands of being there for one another. As I was thinking about this, uh, this, this week and again meditating on Hebrews chapter 10, that's going to be our passage for this morning, um, I thought, you know, why, why is this one another necessary? Why, why are we focusing on this as a church? And I'll say, at first, as, as, we, as we're examining these scriptures and we saw, you know, we Y'all know you can find, you can Google search, you can read books, and they have, you know, lists of all the one another statements in Scripture. And I said, yeah, I want that to be true of us. I want us to be a church that cares for one another, prays for one another. It is, it is like last week, uh, Levi saying, carrying one another towards Jesus, carrying other people towards Jesus, grabbing the edge of the mat and doing whatever it takes to give you some Jesus. Yeah, I, I want this. I, I, I desire this. And as I was reading in Hebrews chapter 10, let's turn here, Hebrews chapter 10, and this week's passage and, and, and encouragement is found in Hebrews chapter 10, verse 24. But as I was, I was reading this focus, I was reminded of some good Bible college uh, classes I took. Um, I took some classes called hermeneutics and homiletics and all, all sorts of funny, uh, good, good words, but all of it had to do is not only when you're preparing for a message, we're preparing to share with somebody. We love to look at verses, and sometimes we've got the one verse, and we kind of like you know we stitch it on a stitch it on a shirt or, or put it on a pillow or something like that. And, and those are uh, those are our verses that we go by. But it's important, and the classes teach you all the time. It's important to look at the context of the person and where it is in Scripture. And man, when I was looking at when I was looking at this context today. Like wow, God, you're so good. I gotta share this, and 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 so uh, we're gonna look here. The, the main verse here is in 24. I was looking at this, and we we're going. Like I said, we have a, a list of scriptures of one another passages. That yeah, we want these to be true of us as Catholic City Church. We want to be obedient to Christ in this. Uh, and so verse 24 here. Let's read it. It says this, and let us consider how we may spur one another on towards love and good deeds. Not giving up meeting together as some are in the habit of doing, but encouraging one another all the more as you see the day approaching. And as I was reading this verse and, and meditating just on this verse, I said, exactly. Yes, we need to be with one another. We want to spur one another on towards good deeds, towards acting like Christ, through sharing compassion for our community and for our neighbors and for our family. For our siblings and for our spouses, we need to do good deeds to others and, and, and be a, a great citizen in our community. And, and we need to do good deeds and pray for one another and, and all the different one another statements that we've gone through. I said, yeah, we, that, that would be a great word. And yes, number verse 25, that uh, we should not meet, give up meeting together. Yes, it's, it's important as the body of Christ, that we would come together as one body on a Sunday morning or on a Wednesday night or over a meal on Saturday morning or whatever it may be. We should meet together regularly. We 
see that example in Acts chapter 2, that that was a result when the Holy Spirit was poured out during that time. That the, the, the body of Christ, they would regularly meet together, eating bread, and, and, and this is what they were doing. They were dedicating themselves to the words that were spoken by the, the leaders of the church. And I said, yeah, we, we, I should be encouraging the church. Let's get together. Let's know one another. And I think we, we, we've done that. And I was, then it transitioned, as I was meditating on that, transitions into context. What is the writer of Hebrews getting across to the, to the people? And one of them, I was reading, reading and it said this, and, uh, verse 25, the last portion of the verse, it says this, And all the more, as you see the day approaching. In, the, in this context here, we, we find that the church of this time, it was a persecuted church. It was a church that was actually in need and, uh, and under attack, not only just in ways of, oh, like today, oh, you Christians, you believe such hateful things. No, it was, a, it was under attack on the point of, my life was at stake for the things that I believe, contrary to those in the society. So as we see the day approaching, as we see Christ returning, we should be gathering, we should be getting together on a regular basis. So we're going to look more at this context that was laid out in, in chapter 10. But I wanted to look also at and remind us of all these amazing passages that we've been looking for and all the ones that there exist, uh, that continue to exist in uh, encouraging us in one another statements. So i got three pages worth of scripture. Uh, I, I, most of the time I try to focus on one scripture. I said there's a ton of, a ton of scripture here. We're thinking about good deeds. I said, oh, there's a, there's a lot of good deeds that we can be doing to one another. So I know in, in you, if you have a pen, you can tick all these down. If not, maybe I could, maybe I could post these somehow, uh, maybe on our uh, Facebook page. Everybody, a uh, Facebook fan, you can go there. But um, let's see, 1 John chapter 4, verse 11. 1 John chapter 4, verse 11, it says this. Beloved, if God so loved us, we must all... We must also ought to love one another. And this is a great overarching theme of the Christian faith, right? That we have been so loved, and so the, the love that we have for one another, the forgiveness we show towards one another, right? The other scripture in Matthew it talks about that we should forgive one another. And if we don't forgive one another, then Christ will not forgive us. But the love, what has been done to us, is then reciprocated out of us. We ought to love one another. Romans chapter 15, verse 7, it says this, that we should welcome one another, or we should accept one another, just as Christ has welcomed you for the glory of God. And we talk about this in, in our homes, in, in, in our daily life. We should be ones that, that have a welcoming heart, that, and everybody is welcome at the table. And talk about our community Thanksgiving dinner. They said, yeah, there's room for everyone at the table for Thanksgiving. We should be ones that welcome one another. 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 25. The members, that the members may have the same care for one another. So 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 25 is Paul talking about how much care that he had and that he had emptied himself out for, for the Corinthian church. And he says, we pray that the, that the church, the member of the church, that you would have the same care for one another as we have, emptying our lives for you. Yes. 1 Peter 4, 10. As each has received a gift, use it to serve one another as God's stewards of God's very grace. 1 Peter 4.10. So 1 Peter 4.10 is to talk about, hey, we each have one a talent. Each one of us has gifts. Each one of us has been created with gifts. It's a grace of God. It's something that God given to each of us. And so we should use the gifts and the talents and the abilities that God has given us for the common good of one another. That we should come together as a church. Hey, come on, let's celebrate that, right? Let's celebrate that. Let's work towards that. Ephesians 5, 21. Wow, this one is a hard one. But we should submit to one another out of reverence for Christ. Wow, submitting. That's the hard one for me to do. Put away my will for the sake of the betterment of the will of others. Wow. Submit to one another. 1 Thessalonians 5.15 It says, Always seek to do good to another and to everyone. So we should always seek to do good, to have a good intentions, to, to seek the best for each other and the, and the body of Christ and for everyone, for everybody who's around us. Ephesians 4.32 Be kind to one another, tender-hearted. 
In Hebrews chapter 10, verse 25, we just read it. Not neglect to meet together as some are in the habit, but encourage one another, and all the more as you see the, the day drawing near. That this should be something that we're daily in each other's lives and encouraging one another. It's going to be especially needed in the last days as persecution increases. Hebrews chapter 10, 24, the verse right before that, that we should stir one another up into love and good works and doing good deeds. Hebrews 3, 13, exhort one another, exhort, build, build one another up, as long as it's called today, so that none of us are hardened by sin's deceitfulness. Colossians 3, 16, let the word of Christ dwell richly in teaching and admonishing one another in all wisdom. Pastor spoke that out a couple weeks ago. We should admonish one another. We should be able to correct one another and, and, and have our best interest in, in one another. Be able to know the scripture and say, hey, you know what, brother or sister, you need to grow up in Christ in this area. And, and sometimes that in, encouraging, it, um, admonishing, it has an encouraging aspect, but it's a correction. And, so, and sometimes I need to remind myself, God, I mean, I, I, your, your correction is good. God, your correction is encouraging. Yeah, I love the fact, God, that you're watching out for me. I love the fact, brother or sister, that you're watching out for me, that you see my life and you correct me. Wow. Uh, and and this is because, because those who are admonishing me and correcting me, those are ones that love me. They're being obedient to Scripture. And we continue in, in seeing that in Ephesians 5, 19, it says that we should address one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody to the Lord with our hearts. I, I love that portion of scripture. I, love, I enjoy singing. I enjoy music. I enjoy uh, being in the presence of God. I enjoy that. And it actually says that we should encourage one another with our songs, with the hymns, with the things that God is speaking to us. That when we come together as a body on Sunday morning or in our homes during the week, that, hey, we should come with something the Lord has spoken to us. And, and hey, can you guys rejoice with me with, with what God has been speaking to me? Can we just sing a song of joy because God has been so good to me? And one of the sweetest moments we had as a missional community was a couple Friday nights ago, we were meeting in our home and, and we just we had our time of discussion and then we put on some worship music and, and, and me and Tammy and Triana were just like looking up different worship songs and we're just sitting there around the table and Rachel was there too and we're just singing. Just thinking about how great and how awesome God's presence is. What? That's how the community should look like. That we can encourage one another in song. I want to encourage you guys on Sunday morning when we come together. We do have a, a planned set of songs that they got. And we do, we do want to pray. I'm continuing to pray that we continue to, to gain more and more skilled musicians. So that on a Sunday morning if we come together and somebody says, You know what? I've got a song that I have in my heart. A song that God wants us to sing and rejoice in Him. That hey, at a, on the fly we'll just be able to say, Hey, could you guys insert this song into the... And we can rejoice in Him. But I want to encourage you, if you have songs, if you have hymns, if you have scripture that God is speaking to you, if you have a word that God has spoken to you, as a body, let's share this together. Let's build one another up. That would be fulfilling these scriptures. Romans chapter 15, verse 5. May the God of endurance and encouragement grant you to live in harmony with one another in accord to Christ Jesus. 2 Corinthians 13, 11, Comfort one another. Man, in our small groups, in our time, man, this is time we need to comfort one another. You're going through something hard. We can surround you and encourage you in, in Christ. Comfort one another. Romans 15, 14, it says, You yourselves are full of goodness, filled with all knowledge, and able to instruct one another. Hey, are we people that are so full of God's word that we can instruct one another in Christ Jesus? It's not the responsibility only of pastors and elders of the church. But as fellow brothers and sisters, we can instruct one another Amen. in the ways of the Lord. Old ones should teach young ones. Young ones can dream, dream. And it all works together because we have the Holy Spirit in us. Romans 12, 10, the last one that I have here, but it says this, that we should outdo one another in showing honor. Outdo one another in showing honor toward one another, each other. As I was thinking about these passages we've been going over and we've been meditating on, as, I've been, as I was meditating on 
Hebrews chapter 10 and, and just want to do a straight message all on that, that we should spur one another on and encourage one another and, and we should do good deeds and we should get these things done. I was awakened to the broader context of Hebrews chapter 10 and awoken to the, to the reason why. Why are all these things important for us? Why are these things, they are commands, they're commands that we should do these things. They're, they're commands that we should, and be in operation, and we should live this way. I said, okay, God, if it was just, why should I do it? If we're just sheer obedience to you, God, I will outdo, I'll try to outdo others in honoring. I, I will try to pray for one another because, I, God, I want to be obedient to you. As I began to look at this passage, I, I saw an emphasis on the first, uh, the, the first and foremost part of our faith. Chapter 10 begins with this. The law is only a shadow of the things to come that are coming, not the realities. For this reason, I, it can never be the same sacrifices repeated endlessly year after year to make perfect those who draw near to worship. Otherwise, would they not have stopped being offered? For the worshipers would have been cleansed once for all and would no longer have felt guilt for their sins. So I'm, I'm looking at the, the greater context in which this passage is found to encourage one another, to spur one another on, and I find it in the context of, of the writer of Hebrews talking about a sin issue and talking about sacrifice. It says here, and we celebrated this at the beginning of worship this morning, that this passage is so uh, amazing because not only does it do away with animal sacrifice, it, but, it, it, and, and I shared that one of our mission community members, she, she hates when talking about animal cruelty, and she, you know, uh, she, she loves animals and, and really cares for animals, but every time we're talking about animal sacrifice, she's like, oh, that, that's terrible that they did that, that why would God, why would God ask people to, to sacrifice animals, they're so pure, they're so, they're so innocent. Yeah, <laughs> Great gospel demonstration in that, right? But we rejoice in Christ, not just that he did away with animal cruelty. That's what I, that's what we explained to her. It's not just that he did away with animal cruelty. No, he, he, he was a better sacrifice. Amen. There is a truth to her statement that animals are innocent. And what a beautiful foreshadowing of Christ that animals are innocent. And, and, and the way that they were able to be sacrificed uh, was a place of this innocent innocent being taking the place of us, a guilty, a guilty human. But Christ wasn't just one that, that did it and, and did it again and had to do it again, but Christ lived a life. His innocence was beyond just his very nature. His innocence was one that was lived out, lived a life completely just like you and I are asked to do. So it continues to read here in, in chapter 10, start in verse 5, it says this, Therefore, when Christ came into the world, sacrifice and offering you did not desire, but a body you prepared for me. With burnt offerings and sin offerings, you were not pleased. Then I said, Here am I. It had risen about me in this world. I have come to do your will, my God. This is an amazing backdrop of Jesus coming to do the will of the Father. If any of us were to be honest this morning, our, our daily life is that that's one of the struggles of my life. That I would always do the will of the Father. But Christ lived such the, the perfect, uh, the perfectly that He did exactly, absolutely, perfectly every will of the Father. He said, the only thing that I do is what I see my Father doing. Wow, God. Thank you, Jesus, that you did that for me. <laughs> Father, Lord, would you strengthen me that I could also live in that way? See, here in the backdrop of this, uh, this encouragement that we should encourage one another daily, that we should meet with one another, that we should spur one another on, is this reminder of, or this focus on, the sacrifice that Christ has given. That he sacrificed his whole life, all of his life, for our sake. In verse 10 it says this, and by that will, by the will of the Father, the will of the Father that we would be reconciled with Him and be made right with Him, 
And by that will, we have been made holy yeah. through the sacrifice of the body of Christ once and for all. Amen. Wow, that's something I have to cling to. I have been made, I have been made, I have been made holy. When we talk, when we can end in this worship service this morning, talking about the victory. Not only was he victorious, but because of his uh, victory, it's been put on me, and now I am victorious, I am righteous, and in this yes. scripture, wow, yes. I am holy? Yes, you are. We have been made holy by the sacrifice of God. I love, uh, in other passages, when Paul's talking about, oh, some of you once were these things, and it goes on to list uh, murderers, and stealers, and adulterers, and, 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 and um, once that caused strife. You once were these things. These things no longer identify who you are. You have been made clean. Now that you are in Christ and you have put your faith in Him, you have been made right with Him. Those things no longer define who you are. Verse 11, it says, Day after day, every priest stands and performs his religious duty. Again and again, he offers the same sacrifices, which can never take away sin. But when the priest had offered for all time one sacrifice for sins, he sat down at the right hand of God. And since that time, he waits for his enemies to be made his footstool. By one sacrifice, he had been made perfect forever, those who are being made holy. Hallelujah. I'm included in that number. We're included in that number. The Holy Spirit also testifies to us about this. First he says, this is the covenant I will make with them. After that time, says the Lord, I will put my laws on their heart. I will write them on their minds. And he adds, their sins and their lawless acts will be remembered no more. Yeah. And where these have been forgiven, sacrifice and sin is no longer, sacrifice for sin is no longer necessary. And we can rejoice. And we can rejoice. Because it's a sacrifice, especially when we talk about animal sacrifice, it wasn't it it wasn't just that the sins were put, uh, put on that, uh, the animal. They were sacrificed for our sake. There was forgiveness in the camp, right? And, and then the Israelites celebrated. But then again, they would have to come back. This now in the, in the, New, Testament, in the New Testament, not only that, that act of putting sin on the animal and sacrificing, it doesn't just, wasn't just a foreshadow of Christ, but it's also a, for, a foreshadow or a looking back for us to say of ways that we try to make ourselves right before the Lord. An example of a demonstration of how we try to make ourselves look right for the Lord. So I try to clean myself up. I try to do better things. I try to accomplish all these good lists of things that I need to do because if I do them, I'll be made right or I'll look right before the Lord. But the only thing that makes us holy, and as much as I want to be, <laughs> as much as I want to be a pastor, say, yes, do these things. Let's accomplish these things. Let's get them done. Let's let them be evident in our life. And I know it will be really good and the church will grow and we'll expand and we'll love each other and it will be beautiful and it will be really good results in our lives if we did them all. And I can just leave a sermon like that, but I have to be honest, when I look at contents of Scripture, it's talking about that there is a sacrifice that is beyond us, there's a sacrifice that is beyond what I can do, or the way I can live, that brings me holiness, that brings me righteousness. It's only in Christ. Amen. So then the passage goes, let's see, follow me with, so then the passage goes into these statements. So since Christ is the one, since nothing you do can make you holy, since nothing you do can make you righteous, but you are righteous, you are whole, you are made holy, you are being made holy, you are victorious, you are set free, you are no longer what you used to be called, it says we should do these things. It says, let us draw near to God. So there is a pain response, we, we draw near to God. In response, in 23, we said that we should um, hold on unwaveringly to the faith and the hope that we profess. It, it says in verse 20, 24 that we read, Let us consider how we can spur one another on towards love and good deeds, not giving up meeting together. Let's, let's do these things. 
as some are in the habit of doing, but encourage one another all, all the more as we see the day approaching. And if we just stop right there, we get really encouraged. We said, yeah, let's do it. Crank it for us. Let's go. Then we also have to think about, so I begin to think about the context in which these things were written. Let's continue. Verse 26. If we deliberately keep on sinning after we have received the knowledge of truth, no sacrifice for sin is left, but only a fearful exaltation of judgment and of raging fire that will consume the enemies of God. Anyone who has rejected the law of Moses died without mercy on the testimony of two or three witnesses. How much more severely do you think someone who deserves to be punished, who has trampled the Son of God underfoot, who has treated as unholy the thing that the blood of the covenant that sanctified them, and who has insulted the Spirit of grace? Yes. So my guilt used to be established by the witness of two or three people saying that I have broke or I have, I have trampled the, the, the law of God. How much more then do you deserve punishment for trampling the Son of God underfoot, treating unholy things and the blood of covenant and sacrifice them, and who has assaulted the Spirit of grace? Verse 30. For we know him who said, It is mine to avenge, I will repay, and again the Lord will judge his people. It is a dreadful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. So I go back to the context of understanding the church, the congregation in which this message was originally given to. A church not like today, sitting in America, in a church that has heat, now, I was going to say AC, we have heat in the winter, we have beautiful lights that get turned on, you got a staff, two staff pastors who pour out our lives on a regular basis, we got a community that though at one point they did picket the expansion of this church, and yes, they may get it mad when we do certain things in the neighborhood, but they pretty much allow us to exist, and don't mind us coming and parking here, or when we get really busy uh, parking on the streets and the, uh, on the way, they, they really don't attack our lives or kill us or threaten to hang us or, or uh, our lives are not really in danger here in Madison, Wisconsin, as much as we think they hate us around here. <laughs> Spoken to a church whose very lives were at stake. Yes. For living a life holy, for living a life clean, for living a life that Christ had called them to live, their lives, their very well-being was at stake for them. And the warning comes to them. Don't keep on sinning. Don't even think about living a way that isn't pleasing to God. Let's continue reading here. Verse 32. Remember those early days after you had received the light, when you endured a great conflict full of suffering, sometimes you were publicly exposed to insult and to persecution. At other times you stood side by side with those who were so treated. You suffered along with those in prison and joyfully accepted the confiscation of your property because you knew that your, you yourselves had better and lasting possessions. So what's beautiful about the people of God is that when we think about the first part of chapter 10, is that our place in Christ is secure. Our place in Him is secure as His holy people, as His victorious one, as His righteous one. We're, that can never be taken from us. So when he fast forwards and he says, hey, you should encourage one another, you should, you should meet together daily, you should draw near to God, it's in light of this and the second part of chapter 10 and saying, hey, we understand there's a real enemy of your soul, there's a real enemy out there that hates your guts, that's going to steal your property, that may steal your job, that may take away your livelihood, that will insult you in the public realm, that, will do, that, will, that can disseminate you and, and can take you to a, a very cross that Jesus died on. That was a very real reality to them. And he says, even with that threat surrounding you, don't sin. Don't give in to it. Don't give up. 
Don't give up. Encourage one another. And, and in that picture, we have the backdrop of all these one another statements. In that picture where death was a real thing, where property to be taken away, where, where imprisonment was real, where the threat of life was real, where the public insult was a real reality, he says, you gotta, you got to be with one another. you got to encourage one another. you got to live together. you got to gather together. you got to pray for one another. you got to keep up with one another. you got to love one another. Because guess what? The world is against you. And today in the 21st century church in America, in the USA, in Madison, Wisconsin, maybe that threat isn't that real to us. And so when we come to these one another statements, uh, they don't have as much oomph behind them. But then I begin, when I begin to reflect on 26 through 34, I said, you know what? We still have sin issues. There's still things in my life where I say, yeah, I'd rather do this. And I'd rather stick with my addiction. I, yeah, I'd rather go back to my old vomit. Yeah, I'd rather sin. I'd rather be like the world. I, I don't want to be insulted in my workplace. What if I get fired because I stand up for Jesus? Uh, these are real questions that come. What if I say that, yes, uh, homosexuality is a sin? You know, what if I stand up for these things? What's going to happen? to me. And, and in some places, there is still a reality that uh, if we stand up for Christ, we will lose things. It will cost me something. And in that backdrop, I say to you, as pastors, we say we need one another. I need, to, I need somebody in my life that will examine me and say, yeah, Andrew, you're slipping a little bit. Yeah, your time with the Lord has been lacking. Yeah, Andrew, you're a little compromising in this area. Yeah, Andrew, you need to stand up. And, and I noticed when you were talking to that gentleman, you didn't say the name of Jesus, and there's a little bit of fear in your life still, Andrew. You need it. I need one another. We need each other. Amen. There's a fear of imprisonment. There's still a fear of loss. There's still a, a fear of losing friendships. And that's when 32 comes and rings into us. Remember those early days. After you have received the light, when you endured in great conflict full of suffering. For the sake of Christ. Remember those first days when we came to Christ when I got rid of every sin in my life, everything I thought I was, that I thought was sin, even if it wasn't sin. I was making sure everything in my life was pure. When I stood up to my uh, friends and like, yeah, that's wrong. When I cried, when I, when I cried in Sunday school because they told me I couldn't pray in school, and I said, no, we gotta pray in school. That's the best place to pray. I mean, yeah. Remember when you were first in love and, and man, no matter what the cost, no matter what my regular routine was, no matter what it would cost me, I was going to get God. Yeah. Amen. Amen. No matter what habit I had, I said, you know what, I know it's not pleasing, i got to get rid of it. No, no matter what routine, no matter what friends I had, no matter, yes, I want it. When we had a clear picture of, of the sacrifice that Christ has given me, that he did once and for all, what do we have to do year after year? And that was at the forefront of my mind. There's an encouragement if we look at the end of chapter 10 to us. Verse 34 says that you suffered along with those that are in prison. You joyfully accepted the confiscation of your property because you knew that you yourselves had better and lasting possessions. How are we able to live a life that is different than those who are around us? How are you able to live a life that is full of sacrifice? How are you able to live a life that is, a, that is free from addiction, free from our, our self-pleasures, free from our other, otherly ways of life? Because we know, in verse 20, 34, because you knew that yourself had a better and lasting possession. That my unity with Christ was a better and lasting possession. That if we look back to 25, that it says we should do this all the more as we see the day approaching. That day is talking about the day that we're united with Christ. When Christ returns for us or, or death allows us to be present with Him. Verse 25 says this, So you do not throw away your confidence. It will be richly rewarded. You need 
this is for us this morning. You need to persevere so that when you have done the will of God, you will receive what He has promised. For in just a little while, He who is coming will come and will not delay. And by my righteousness, one will live by faith. And I take no pleasure in the one who shrieks back. You need to persevere. We need to persevere. Yeah. To hold on to the faith. To hold on to Christ. To hold on to His holiness. To pursue His holiness. To with everything, with every ounce in our bodies to go after. No matter what the cost. No matter what the shame. Tell, uh, we saw a passage earlier to, uh, to confess to one another so that they can pray for us that, that sin will be defeated, that we will be delivered from our sin and our wickedness. Why do we get together in our homes? Why do we get together on Sunday morning? Why is it we can confess to one another, letting them know, hey, this is the sin that's, that's, that's been trapping me. This is the sin that I keep on going back to. It's the sin that I keep on uh, holding on to. These addictions, these, these cravings for fleshly things, the, these cravings for the ungodly nature of me to live a little longer. The, the, all these, it, it's still in me. I confess them so that one another, we can pray. Well, all these one another statements is not only about us looking like a better community. It's so that we can live a holy life. Yes. Amen. And that's what I begin to realize as I read this passage. And I, I said, yeah, this is a great one another statements. Yes, do good deeds. Yes, go towards love. It's so that we be a holy people. We need one another. We need one another so that we can persevere, so that we can receive the promise of eternal life within. Verse 39. This is the truth this morning to us in this room to receive. We do not belong to those who shriek back and are destroyed, but to those who have faith in our Savior. This is who we are, folks. This is who we are. We are people who do not belong to those who strip back and are destroyed, but we are people who live by faith and are saved. Yes. Amen. We come together as a family of servant missionaries to gather together, to encourage one another, to pray, to lift one another up, to do good deeds, to care for those who are in need, to do a Thanksgiving dinner, to care for our community. We do all these things, yes, for, them, for others to see Christ, but for this main purpose, that we will remain holy, that we will remain righteous, and that we together will receive the prize that is set before us, the promise that is to be united with Christ forever. We don't belong to those who shriek back and are destroyed. That's right. But we belong to those who are in faith, who continue to seek after Christ, who continue to find ways that we would look more like Him, who continue to find ways to bring salvation, to bring wholeness into my life, into the, to the life of my family, to the life of my neighbors, and to the life of my community. We are those who have faith. And when we have faith and hold on to this that Christ has done for us, His sacrifice that was once and for all, we come together and we look like a body Amen. that looks like Christ. Amen. And we are the living stones that are held together. We are a body that is an envious of a, a different part, but we come together in strength to represent who Christ is to the world. This morning, I don't know where you are with all of these statements. And it, it, they are plentiful, the commands of God, for us to say uh, what we can do for one another. In our time, in our season today, in Madison, Wisconsin, 2017, heading into 2018, in a couple months, right around the border, I know we don't face persecution as such that our lives are in danger. But we do face a true enemy who is out to destroy our souls. Amen. We do face temptations and desires within our hearts that, that still do not 
and have not been completely conformed to the Lord. But this morning I declare this truth to us, that we are made holy through Christ Jesus. We do have a way out, a way of victory. We do have a righteousness that's been attributed to us because of life that Christ lives on our behalf. And so just as the writer of Hebrews encouraged the church in this day, I will read again verse 26. Do not deliberately keep on sinning after you have received the knowledge of truth, because no sacrifice for sin is left, but only a fearful expectation of judgment and of raging fire that will consume the enemies of God. And I thought, wow, what a tough word for people that were facing death for the sake of Christ. But we can't avoid the tough words to, to only cling to the promises, to only cling to the good things, to only cling to the good encouragement that we should love one another. We need one another because our, our, our ability to come together allows us to conquer sin. We were not meant to be lone rangers, to figure it out ourselves. Those of us in this room, we can come to one another, we can encourage one another, and, and you know, sometimes we won't have all the answers. But you know what? Together, we go to the one who does. We go to the one who lived it. We go to Christ who lived it and says, and, and says that He can identify with everything that we go through. Amen. So if my brother comes to me and confesses something, I'm like, I know the answer is Jesus. I don't know how to do it. Hey, let's pray together that we can get more Jesus. Last week's message was great. Hey, I, I'm not quite sure how to do it, but I know Jesus is the answer, so let me get you to Jesus. I want to get my brother, I want to get some sister, and we're, we're going to carry you to Jesus, because I know that's what you need. Amen. Right? When we come together like this, it's all about, the reason why we come together is all about that we would live holy life. And this day, and this time, and this moment, you for Christ. So why don't we bow our heads this morning? As we bow our heads, we reflect on this. Depart from all the words and all the good deeds to encourage one another to be with one another, to pray for one another, to do good deeds, to outdo one another in love. But on this, God, is there sin in my life that's holding me back of your promise? Holy thing, blood of the covenant. 